So I'm, uh, yeah, so this is the level of detail, which is obviously a term that has kind of both uh, game development and non-game development um, meanings to it in that you know, the level of detail is in, in terms of geometry shown in game is determines, you know, how much you get to see depending on how close you are to the objects uh, in, on the screen. But it's also a level of detail is something that's come up in discussions throughout this weekend about, you know, how far into medieval detail do you want to go uh, in your games or when you're creating your own medieval worlds or, or fantasy worlds or anything like that? And that's that's kind of a, you know, there is no, there is no, there's lots of wrong answers. There's probably no right answers because uh, every situation will be a little bit different. So before we go uh, any further, I just want to give a brief background on myself. Um, I'm an Arch architectural historian, uh, archaeologist. I'm a buildings archaeologist, so I survey and measure and study standing buildings, which is much better than regular archaeology because I don't get to stand out in the mud, in the cold, in the rain. Instead, I get to stand in really lovely buildings, kind of looking around and scratching my chin and saying, hmm, isn't that interesting, while very kind old ladies bring me cups of tea. So that's a really good way to do it. And cake. Sometimes you get cake as well. So if you're thinking of a career in archaeology, be a buildings archaeologist. It's, it's much more civilized. Um, I'm also uh, an environment artist specializing in buildings and especially churches. And so much of my career has been spent sort of um, building reconstructions or recreations of medieval ecclesiastic architecture and based on sort of what survives today or what maybe doesn't survive. And so um, there's this big question that always comes up with every project that I do, which is, what do we do about representing how accurate we are? And also, um, what do we do about the places where we have little to no information at all? So, and I think this is a question that's applicable, whether we're working in a, in a visual format here with sort of 3D modeling and game environments, or whether we're thinking about um, how much historical or social detail do we put into the game sort of at, at, you know, what do we do with the stuff that we really, really know? And then what do we do with for the, you know, 90% of stuff that we just, just don't know. But when you're making a game and you're kind of creating a world, suddenly you need to present, you need to show that. Because it's one thing to be a historian and say, oh, well, the build that, you know, the castle would have at this time had two gatehouses. And then you just say that because we have a bit in the documentary evidence that says we've got gatehouses. You say, oh, at this time we would have had two gatehouses and you move on to the next point. Well, you know, that could be anything. And so how do you actually show that when you need to sort of do a, a recreation, something a little bit more visually or sensorily immersive? Um, so I'm just showing uh, on the screen right now a kind of split three ways view of the same space on the left is St. Stephen's Chapel, Westminster uh, Palace, which is, uh, this becomes the first House of Commons. So here it is the chapel in the 14th century, which was very much the Kings of England's uh, answer to the Kings of France, Saint-Chapelle, which we'll see later. Um, and it was this amazing government boondoggle, which went through three kings and generations of craftspeople and cost a recognizable proportion of GDP for um, the Kingdom of England. And it was finally finished, and uh, it, was, uh, it was this amazing building, and it's now completely lost. Um, and then the little triangle bit in the middle is when the building was converted after the Reformation to the first chamber of the House of Commons. And then on the left is, again, that exact same space, uh, but when it was converted in 1707 by Christopher Wren into a more sort of um, capacious and purpose-built chamber of commons. So um, anyway, that's, that's sort of some of my own work and where I'm coming from. So there's, this is going to be a very visual presentation. So I want to talk about this level of detail in terms of accuracy, authority, and imagination. And accuracy to me is kind of meaning it's accurate in that, yeah, it feels right. Maybe the minute details aren't correct, but generally it feels right. So we could say it's accurate. Um, and then we'll talk about issues of authority, authorities in the image, and then we'll talk about how you deal with gaps and, and how you have to fill those gaps with imagination. And again, um, this is meant to sort of spark questions. I don't want to be authoritative, actually. Um, I, would, I would rather spark discussion. So getting back to kind of medieval or, or early modern views on accuracy and authority and historical recreation, um, this is Robert Kampen's uh, Annunciation Altarpiece. And uh, in this, he, he's creating this in the uh, first half of the 15th century. 
And, um, but he's trying to very clearly and sort of photorealistically visualize um, an event which happened 1400 years or more before his time. Um, so he's really trying to sort of, to create something that's quite visually um, convincing, realistic, uh, and, and evokes an event and a time um, that, that he well knows happened a long time ago in the past. And yet um, he's created this very, very uh, contemporary um, Dutch interior uh, and exterior. So if you look on the left side, you have the donors of the altarpiece and they're outside Mary's house door. And then on the right, you have Joseph in his workshop. He's uh, doing some woodworking and you can see the cityscape beyond. There is nothing about this that suggests first century Palestine anywhere. They're all in, um, they're not in contemporary dress except for the donors on the left. Um, but, but every detail in this room is directly from Campen's time, not from the time of the Annunciation. Um, so, you know, it, it's quite fascinating. Even on the left, you can see that the, the city wall there that you see the city gate and the city wall, it's a brick city wall and city gate. So it's a very low countries because there's not building stone there. Um, so it's, it's a very much rooted in its own time and place while very much trying to almost photorealistically portray an event of import in the past. So in the Middle Ages, ideas of accuracy and historical recreation were, um, were fluid as well. And maybe that's the approach we should take because the Middle Ages, um, I usually don't put memes in, but this one went around, it was just too good not to use. Um, this is from Fake History Hunter over on Twitter. Really, the, the sort of definition between how we right now in the 21st century tend to often in popular imagination think about the Middle Ages as sort of right there with everything dirty and horrible and, and, and plague ridden. And then we have uh, the real Middle Ages on the left because the real Middle Ages were weird. Um, and the, their imagination was in full technicolor and was um, full of all sorts of things which are, are just bizarre and inexplicable. So of course the very famous Hieronymus Bosch triptych, uh, which is now called the Garden of Earthly Delights, showing um, the Garden of Eden sort of on the left and showing kind of like the anti-Garden of Eden on the right and in the middle, the Earthly Garden of Eden. Uh, and and who exactly knows what he's trying to say here, but uh, it's a fascinating painting, just letting you know that uh, they weren't afraid of imagination as well. So let's talk about accuracy. So some of you may be playing through Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Um, and this, and some of you may have watched The Dig on Netflix about the excavation of the Sutton Hoo ship burial. And um, in Valhalla, you can ride around in kind of Suffolk and you come across the Sutton Hoo ship burial um, kind of in process of either being um, buried or being excavated. I think it might be sort of somewhere in between. And it's a relatively accurate in terms of, yeah, it feels right, accurate recreation. It's it's the right kind of ship mostly. It's got the right kind of little sort of house hut chamber over the middle of it. Um, it's being, it's half in a mound. And uh, there's lots of little sort of interesting homey details like the, the tents going on around it here, um, almost as the workers or maybe robbers. The fact that scaffolding's up suggests that maybe something is actually being built rather than torn down, but again, we don't know. Um, and, uh, and then of course they've laid out, you know, planking into the muddy ground and things like that. So, um, you know, accurate and, you know, this, this evokes a feeling, I think in some ways better than most of the sort of reconstructions drawn of this, um, by sort of quote unquote archeologists and, and historians. Um, another bit of accuracy from Valhalla, uh, on the left, we have the real Bellas Nap in Gloucestershire. And on the right, we have the same, um, Neolithic monument in, in, Valhalla and we see again that it's you know I mean there's some differences but it, it still evokes the time a time that would be much less sort of manicured and kept than it is now um, and the sort of mystery uh, and feel of this kind of space that you would come across out there in, in, in the hills on, in the supporter country so again um, somebody's done their research in the game while they're setting it up less accurate. And here's where I start to take some issue and, and sort of architectural historian in me starts to, to get a little grouchy. Because if they can do research and, and, and find things like Bella's Nap and they do Sutton Who with such detail, um, if you look, there's a problem with the castles in Valhalla. And I spotted this like at the release trailer, the teaser trailer for it when there's a castle kind of in the background. 
Um, all of the castles in Valhalla are inexplicably 14th century in style. Um, there isn't necessarily a, um, in, the, in the Saxon period or in the kind of invasions, Saxon sort of period, um, there aren't, there are things that are called castles, but as far as we know, um, they're not really castles in the sense that we kind of imagine them now. Um, so the thing on the right, which even though it's in Scotland, um, Trustees Hill kind of is more what you would be going for for a castle than the one on the left. Um, and they're kind of, you know, palisaded hill forts, essentially. Um, and so it's interesting that you get this big difference. And one of the difference is that uh, the creators of Valhalla said they wanted to reintroduce verticality into the Assassin's Creed series. And so they had to create these really huge vertical stone fantasy castles that are, are centuries and centuries anachronistic. Um, but anyway, it, it, you know, if you could do the research in one area, why not the other? Um, this is my quote unquote hometown of York, um, um, Jorvik in, in the Viking. This would, this would become the center of the kind of Viking kingdom. Um, and, you know, Norway would be ruled from here from sort of the ninth, 10th century for, for a couple hundred years. So this is York. And um, again, in lots of ways, overall, it's, it's quite accurate. So you have running down the center of the screen, the river Ouse, and uh, just way, way, way down the far lower right corner, you have a little tiny bit of water, which is really hard to see in this image, but um, that's part of the river uh, Foss, and they come together just out of screen, just down below at the bottom here. And um, that's where York Castle is today. Um, interestingly, you have a, a large Roman amphitheater, the ruins of it on the left, now, the, the Roman amphitheater in York uh, has never been discovered. Its position and location has never been found. But there are many theories about where it would be found. And I remember doing some ground penetrating radar survey right in that area that's shown in this image of, um, of York. In that area, we were trying to find uh, the remains of the amphitheater using some GPR survey. Uh, we didn't find it. But uh, anyway, that is sort of one of the areas in the city that people think might be. So it's interesting that there's like some research there. If you look at the bridge, the, the closest bridge in the middle, you see that it's the kind of humpback shape. And that is that preserves the shape of the medieval bridge, which was Ouse Bridge and the only official bridge over over the River Ouse. So you've got two bridges here. That second one shouldn't really be there. It's it's in a modern place. Um, but that Ouse Bridge there and that kind of big arch humpback span, that's accurate. York Minster, the cathedral's in its right place. Um, a lot of things are sort of correct about this, but the thing that bothers my architectural historical eye is on the left, um, and I don't know if we can see my cursor or not, but on the left, um, there's this church standing here. And while that's in the position of a very old church, a Saxon church called St. Mary Bishop Hill Senior, um, the tower on, and the tower on that church is some of the oldest standing fabric in the city, which goes back to probably right at the conquest period. So right around the, the sort of 11th century or a little bit earlier, um, so it is old fabric, but the tower, that tower there kind of from a distance looks like a copy of the one that exists today, which is, which is again, a sort of century or two out of date for Valhalla's time period. Also, the top of it is 19th century uh, fantasy. So um, again, they're just getting some details wrong and I might, I might be nitpicking this too much and I probably am, um, but to my architectural historical eye, this is telling a bizarre story to my eye. Like I'm fine with the enormous speculative Roman ruins throughout the city. It was a major Roman city, why not? Um, I'm fine, this, this is two arches, it should be one, if it existed at all in this period. Um, and you know, I'm fine with some of the differences on the Minster here, but um, overall, this is telling a bizarre story of, of a city that that's supposed to be in the ninth century, but is actually what I'm seeing on screen is spanning the sort of first century all the way through to the 21st century, quite honestly. Um, and here's the thing that's the, the kicker for me. I'm really going to nitpick this. This is again over in Gloucestershire. This is St. Kenelm, which was a real saint. Um, and here's his statue here in Valhalla on the left. And that statue looks a lot like this wooden statue, like almost exactly like this wooden statue. Um, this is supposed to again be ninth century. And this is a statue uh, that was created in the early 20th century, aping a, a kind of medieval style. Um, but that medieval style is a very 15th or 16th century medieval style. So um, while overall they like the big details right, and somebody has done the research, 
in terms of style, they're all over the place as though like medieval is medieval is medieval and it doesn't matter which century it's from. And to me, it, it, it robs it robs the visual element of the game from some interesting depth of environmental storytelling that they could have built in sort of for free. If they were going to build it, they could have built it um, a little bit more, a little bit eye to more historical accuracy and would have told a rich story, in my opinion. Moving over to another um, Assassin's Creed game. Um, we're moving to Assassin's Creed Unity, which isn't medieval, but has a lot of really great medieval buildings in it. And uh, we're going to look here at the Saint-Chapelle. So this is a 13th century um, jewel box building, which is made as a reliquary to house the crown of thorns, hence the crowns of thorns up around the top here, um, and maybe to keep assassins from climbing up it. But um, this is the in-game model of the exterior, which looks really close to the exterior today of the building. Um, and, uh, and as we all know, the interior is, is magnificent, but the detail in this is, is fantastic. One of the things when I saw the, the reveal trailer many years ago for Assassin's Creed Unity that I was really excited about was that as um, your hero is climbing all over the architecture, um, the molding profiles in the architecture are correct. And my architectural history sort of sensors went off. And I thought, oh, that's telling a really beautiful, rich and deep story here. Um, no one gets the molding profiles right, but they were doing it right here and all the beautiful kind of rain on, which is actually, mm, well, we'll talk about that. Well, we won't, but anyway, we can nitpick again. And I'm not, the problem with that, but overall it's so kind of accurate. This is the interior, which is mm, lovely. This is mwah, chef's kiss. This is a beautiful, beautiful interior of the Saint-Chapelle. And if anybody's been there or seen pictures, I mean, it is this, you go inside and it's a, a, a jewel. It's like being inside a jewel. And while there's some clutter in here that's not necessarily historical in nature, like all these cables across and, and these enormous incense burners, um, that's, that's for gameplay reasons. And that's, you know, great, great. That's really good. You really get to explore this space. Um, but it's, it's a gorgeous, rich, rich, rich reproduction. Even though it's not every fine little detail from the reality, that's okay because this is totally accurate and it mm, feels right. Um, at this time, it was being kind of used as a storehouse and a bit of a neglected building. But again, we won't worry about that. Um, it's, it's stunning and gorgeous. And then, of course, their famous recreation of Notre Dame. And, and that recreation um, has kind of gotten into the news a little bit uh, in the past, well, now 18 months from the burning of Notre Dame, which of course happened in April 2019. Um, it went around again that the modeler, there was one modeler who was the chief lead on this um, model of this cathedral, and it took her in consultation with a historian. It took her uh, two years to create this model, and I can sympathize with that. Um, and it's supposed to be super, super ultra accurate of uh, Notre Dame. It isn't, the molding profiles aren't quite right. Um, and there's a lot of other things which aren't quite right, uh, again, for gameplay reasons and expediency. Um, but when it burned, uh, Ubisoft apparently made this model available to Notre Dame Cathedral as something which would help them in the rebuilding. Now the cathedral had had laser scans done of it, which would be much more metrically accurate. Um, those had pre-existed before even Assassin's Creed Unity. So they had this sort of metric detail. I'm not sure what this model would add, but it was a real kind of marketing boost for um, Ubisoft. Um, but anyway, you know, as far as accurate, yes. Um, so the Assassin's Creed games are, are, are accurate, but sometimes when they're willfully not, as we've talked about. Um, and one thing I'd just like to kind of bring up and mention is that one reason perhaps besides gameplay and budget and many other reasons why the medieval buildings in Unity are more kind of accurate than the buildings that you get in Valhalla or how Valhalla becomes accurate but in a kind of cherry-picked way is because um, everywhere where they're more accurate are places that still exist. Um, the overall plan and shape of the city of York still exists. Uh, Bella's Nap still exists. Um, that that statue model of St. Kenelm exists. And so they're reproducing digitally something that they can go see and put their hands on right now. Whereas when they get to the more speculative things like castles, for example, they don't exist anymore. And so there's this huge imaginative gap there. The historical record says in the ninth century there were castles, um, but there is the very scarcest of evidence remaining for it physically and there's almost no sort of visual representations of it from the period so they have to fill that gap 
with um, imagination and, and styliz stylization and periodization seems to disappear. So let's talk about models that are meant to be not only accurate, but are really meant to be authoritative, to be something that sort of comes from some official source to say, this is really our best, our best guess as to what a space looked like in the past because we've had the experts work on it for a long time. And so this has a weight authority because it's endorsed by the custodians of the place which still exists. Um, and this is getting into my own work for the Center for the Study of Christianity and Culture at the University of York, uh, for which I was their senior modeler for many, many, many years. Um, well, we'll take one many off, just two many, too, too many, many years. Um, so we'll talk, we'll talk about accuracy and authority in one building. And this is in the Lady Chapel at Glastonbury Abbey. This is actually um, a 12th century, late 12th century building, which is built in an anachronistic style at Glastonbury Abbey for various historical and spiritual reasons. And this is the exterior of the chapel as it survives today. And on the right, you have an image of the building as uh, the interior details of the building, which actually, believe it or not, uh, still retains some of their medieval paint color. But, but here's the detail of the building as it exists today. So quite a lot of it survives. And here are some of my recreations of it. On the left, we have that exterior again, and I've put the roof back on and I finished off some of the details. And this is, I would say, an authoritative, um, I'm an archeologist and the team I worked with were archeologists and architectural historians. Um, and this is, you know, based on all of the historical and the physical evidence that remains, of which there is a lot. Um, we have a really good idea of what this building looked like in the past. So there it is on the past. So the exterior of the building, I think, carries authority and accuracy. The interior of the building, even though there, there, some of the paint survives, so we know exactly how all of this area right in here on these arcades were painted because that's where the paint still survives and small enough traces, but you can recreate it um, pretty much with precision. But all the rest of the interior decoration of this building is speculative. And it's based on lots of research from the time and other buildings that do survive and paint schemes that, that survive. Um, but really in the end, it's much more speculative. But because it's kind of done in a quote unquote photorealistic manner, um, both of these images carry, and, and this is the official image. If you go to Glastonbury Abbey today, this is somewhere on the, in the museum on the site. It carries with it authority as though um, this is not to be questioned as much. But to me, every image is an, is an argument that is meant to be questioned. It's the start of a conversation rather than the end of one. But this carries with it on the exterior authority and on the interior, I think it carries with it accuracy, but, but much less um, certainty. Going to another um, project we were doing, we were rebuilding the, well, redecorating the interior of the east end of Durham Cathedral around the shrine of St. Cuthbert, who's a very, very, very important Anglo-Saxon saint. Um, so Durham Cathedral, some of you may recognize as the um, original Hogwarts in the first three Harry Potter movies. They filmed it at Durham Cathedral and they just kind of put some towers and stuff on top of the towers to make it look more magic-y. Um, but it's a, a, a fantastic Norman cathedral from the 12th, uh, from the 11th and 12th centuries. Um, and then in the 13th century, they built this, this whacking great East End on, which houses the shrine of St. Cuthbert. It's called the Chapel of Nine Altars. Um, Durham Cathedral has so much evidence. The building still exists and it's been hardly altered, except for all of the gold and jewels from the shrine have been stripped out and all the paint off the walls have been stripped out. But um, the building still stands pretty much intact as it was. And um, we even have bits and pieces of the treasures that were associated with the Shrine of St. Cuthbert. This is in the British Museum in a fantastic storeroom that the people, the regular public don't get to see, which is kind of an, an astonishing place. Um, but in this place, they throw a bunch of their medieval collection because the medieval collection is kind of like way down the list of important collections at the British Museum. And um, sitting in this case, it, on the right side is this enormous curving thing, which is an honest to gosh, griffin um, claw. And that's this comes from the shrine of St. Cuthbert. And in the Middle Ages, in the inventory of all of the sort of holy relics and other interesting objects they had in the shrine there, uh, they had griffin claws. And this is actually one of those. Uh, it was saved at the Reformation and went through private hands until it ended up in the British Museum. And of course, it's not, a, it's, well, I mean, maybe it's a griffin claw, maybe it's not, who knows. But there it is. We have so much evidence 
including this, which is not actually a toilet roll. Um, this is actually a scroll called the Rites of Durham, and it's a mid 16th century document or, or a late 16th century document written by someone who was probably a novice at the cathedral right during, um, it was a monastery as well, so he was a novice in the Benedictine priory there. And um, he wrote, he basically goes on a tour of the entire building and writes bay by bay what used to be there uh, before the Reformation swept it all away. So we have a, a visual list of everything that was in the space, including Cuthbert's shrine, which allows us to do a reconstruction like this. And for those game devs out there who are interested in the more technical side of things, um, this is this is a screen grab from a frame rendered in real time in Unity, in case you want to see a kind of high poly, high, high resolution model running in real time. There we go. Um, I decided to use Unity as my renderer because I was tired of offline renderers. Um, but this is the Shrine of St. Cuthbert. It doesn't exist anymore, um, but we have a really good description of it. And uh, we have a big description of what's in all of these reliquary cupboards. So here we're standing in the floor outside of that. Um, right now, there's no, there's no paint on the interior of the building at all, except in a few places that allows us to reconstruct some of this. Um, but all of these banners, this is the captured banner from the King of Scotland when he was captured at the Battle of Neville's Cross in the mid 14th century. That was hanging there. Um, the, the writer of the Rites of Durham tells you all of the banners of the families who were involved in that. This is captured war booty, as is this. Um, we know there was a watching loft over here where a hermit lived to look after the shrine. And we know there were these huge cupboards and there were these huge iron grills around it because the, the holes for the grills still exist. And there were these huge cupboards and that's where things like that griffin claw um, and the unicorn horns and the pieces of the true cross and the, the skull of John the Baptist and all that sort of stuff, that's where they all resided. Um, but the problem was, it's a problem of scale here in that all the really, really interesting things about the shrine space are really, really tiny and are hard to model. And so you don't even see them. So the bulk of our evidence is actually written and documentary and very clear, but it would all be inside this cupboard. So again, we have this sort of problem of scale and what do we do? How do we imagine that? And um, I took essentially the easy way out and we didn't imagine it. We just said, imagine it's in those cupboards. I want to get on to um, the kind of core piece here. And this is the um, uh, visualization of the Chapel of St. Stephen's Westminster, which we saw at the beginning. And again, this is a model I made in consultation at the Center for the Study of Christianity and Culture with a huge raft of, base, of art historians historians, archaeologists, and other subject area experts. Um, and this model took us three years to build. And it wasn't three years full time, but it was three years half time and more than half time to build. Um, like I said, this is of huge historical importance, and this is on display in the Houses of Parliament now, um, of huge historical importance, because it goes from this glorious sort of royal chapel to the first House of Commons. So we wanted to sort of recreate it. And we had a lot of evidence. Um, but let's talk about our evidence. Uh, this is our evidence. Um, the building is gone, it doesn't exist anymore, except maybe its basement, which is another chapel, but that may have been rebuilt. We don't actually have very good um, evidence on what they did after the fire. But on the left is the only visual representation we have of that building before the Reformation. This is a 1530 ink panorama drawing, and they only have the slightest sketch of the building here on the left. Um, that's the only contemporary representation we have of it. It's not exactly full of detail. Um, in 1834, there was a huge fire which burned out the House of Commons. And when the House of Commons got burned out, all that Wren woodwork was destroyed and it revealed what was left of the medieval chapel. So you see all these details up here um, and we can see the windows having been revealed again. We can see the shape of the great east window and that sort of stuff. And now what survives, and all that was cleared out, the only thing that survives is where some guerrilla antiquarians went onto the building site while these workmen were just literally tipping this into bins and into the river. Um, they captured, they, they, they basically grabbed pieces of the building that were left and they ran off with them. Um, and these are now in the British Museum in their storeroom that nobody gets to see anymore. Um, and you can see all the, the level of paint and gilding and work that goes on these small pieces of the, of the building to show you how richly ornamented it was. But this is all we have left. Fortunately, before the fire, um, they were doing some renovation work and another guerrilla antiquarian um, called Carter 
he actually got in and he got behind Wren's woodwork where all of the medieval painting was still preserved. And he made these amazing measured drawings showing molding profiles and color works and decorative patterns that still survived back there. And from these, we were able to do reconstruction. So I take a molding profile that, that Carter recorded. It's not actually shown in this picture. Uh, and the picture in the lower right here, I take that molding profile, extrude it along the path of the window, and then paint it up according to Carter's color notes. Um, other evidence that survived the fire or because of the fire, a guy named McKenzie went and surveyed all the surviving evidence and then imaginatively drew in things like the window tracery and the statues. Um, and then we all have the building accounts. So we know how many workmen worked on the site and how much they were paid and what the materials were that were bought. But the physical building accounts give us no description of how anything worked. So in one way, they're kind of useless. Other forms of evidence to fill in our gaps. So we had the basic shell of the building, but that wasn't nearly adequate for a space like this to begin reconstructing it. So we had to work on um, contemporary or comparative evidence. So for example, for the apostle statues that were along the walls, um, we went and got the 14th century apostle statue from the portal of Cologne Cathedral um, and, uh, and doing photogrammetry on those. And then um, I and my wife by hand using, well, I mean, virtually by hand um, uh, using our, using our um, drawing tablet, he went into those models and repainted them. Uh, the paint colors are chosen based on surviving fragments of paint, and we had a whole gigantic consultation about that. The stained glass is all completely rebuilt. We have no idea what the stained glass was in there, um, but we know what it would, we could give a pretty good guess about it was. And so we found other bits of 14th century stained glass. We had a world expert on that, uh, on medieval English glass. Um, and he provided us with the different examples that still survive around the country today. And we hired a, a 2D artist named Dominic Palslin, not Dominic Palslin, sorry, Dominic Andrews. Um, we hired him and he basically went and kind of in 2D virtually restored those panels of glass. And then I assembled them fragment by fragment into a full set of stained glass windows. This is the east window. And you can zoom right in and see this like in intense detail. And then for some of the furniture that survived, like this big screen here, which I recreated, um, this big screen is based on the possibly contemporary, possibly late 14th century washing loft of the Shrine of St. Alban in St. Alban's Abbey. So we had comparative evidence as well. And that's how we tried to fill in the gaps. We left a lot out. One reason why this project took three years was because um, I modeled a lot of stuff, which then our, um, art historical um, art historian kind of um, supervisor uh, threw away because for one reason or another it was just not at a level of accuracy or authenticity that he was comfortable putting his name on and so we threw it out so uh, here's here's one version of the screen um, and that's gone the whole undercroft I spent a long time doing photogrammetry down there because like I said it might survive and I I've recreated that we threw that out um, the vestibule, which is a deeply rich space, um, and we have some records of, we threw that out because we, because we weren't art historically satisfied enough. And then we spent many, many months recreating the entire exterior of the building. And then at the very end, in the last few months before the project was displayed in um, the Houses of Parliament, we threw that out as well. Um, so <laughs> we're left with mainly interior shots. But I want to show you just to, to take some of the authority out of a sort of photorealistic image like this. Um, let's drain the authority from this image because it is accurate, but does it really carry authority? Well, let's map in where we actually have surviving evidence. Everything that's in color is surviving evidence. Um, everything that isn't is stuff we essentially made up. We had an, a guess, they were educated guesses, but they were just guesses. Um, and so this, all the stuff in color is physically where the building survived the fire and where it was recorded by antiquarians. Some of these painted panels have survived and the painting scheme, the decorative painting scheme in here survived enough and was recorded that we could reconstruct this, but we don't even have the floor. We don't have the ceiling. We don't have the entire second story. We don't have any of the woodwork from the, the stalls, none of the altar area none of the statues, um, none of that survived. And what's interesting is it was a three-year project. 
we built the whole building in the first year and then we spent the next two years arguing about all these details because um, the imagination in a project that's supposed to carry authority like this um, is kind of frightening. So let's get to the imagination part, because I think these gaps between the record that we have and the place where we want to get, um, these gaps can be places for terror if you're making an authoritative reconstruction. But if you're making a reconstruction to kind of live in and engage with, to interact with, um, maybe you can, you can thread the needle between Valhalla, which doesn't seem to pay a lot of attention to periodic sort of stylization, um, and, and something that's sort of rigidly authoritative, like my St. Stephen's model or Durham um, or Glastonbury. Maybe we can come in between those and maybe we can do that in a playful way. So I'm just going to show a couple of the games that I'm working on. I know we're running on time here. We're running into time here. Um, the first one is the, the, the Cathedral Builder game, the Mason's Loft, which I've mentioned a, a, a couple times in chat and uh, in breakout sessions. And this is a game that I'm um, still in development on, although we've just done a sort of live uh, beta test of it with students. This was made for Kenyan College. We've been working on it for many years because we keep taking it apart and putting it back together again. Um, but this is to uh, allow students to take one bay of a cathedral at a time and to build their own cathedral and get some idea of sort of how these buildings stand up physically, but also to understand stylistic differences so here's an example of kind of half of a cathedral you, you could build in game. Um, and you can see the transition between Gothic here on the West End and your Romanesque Eastern End. And this, um, the game has a little mechanic whereby you have a certain number of moves in the Gothic style, a certain number of bays to build, and it's kind of randomly assigned. And when you run out of bays, you have to start building in Gothic so that you get an idea that these buildings took a long time to build and that they're a mix of styles and that when you get your eye sensitive to a mix in styles, you start to see a story being told there of why it took so long, how you have generations of people working on it and how their visions change and adapt. Uh, and then the final game is one I want to show you, um, which is called The Resurrection. I'm building that, that game currently. Um, and this is this this little gif here is just kind of sorry the blurriness, but this little gif here is kind of showing you the principle of the game. Um, it's an invented island. It's a fake island, and you have 12,000 years of depth. So you go back to the Mesolithic at the end of the last ice age, and then you go forward in time beyond our own time, um, and you have an island that's ruined and deserted, and it's kind of in this little low poly um, diorama kind of of presentation, you have ruins and you just rebuild the ruins. And as you rebuild the ruins, you learn the story of the island. But the idea was this comes out of my own experience of doing historical recreations and running into those spaces, those gaps you have between the evidence you have surviving, which are just ruins, and kind of your imagination of what it would have looked like in its heyday. And all the areas where you have um, room for argument, a room to um, to have some variation of interpretation. And so I imagined the rebuilding process in this game as a conversation. So I'd been playing a lot of games that were basically just conversation dialogue systems. Like, what do you do in The Witcher? Well, no, you don't run around and fight monsters. Really what you do in The Witcher is you plow through um, narrative branches. So um, we're doing those kind of narrative conversation branching narrative system, but with a building. So I'll show you in another GIF here. So you have different parts of the building and um, you can start to rebuild them. And if you hover over them, sometimes you get several different options and both options are correct based on the evidence you have. But as you build with different options, so here we see an option switch, there we go. Um, as you build them, it opens and closes different narrative paths, different ways in which that building gets rebuilt. So at this point, um, they've actually, the user's actually chosen to build a two-story building. They don't know that. If they chose differently, it would have been three stories. Both would have fit the evidence that's surviving. And once that's complete, um, that bit of the conversation is complete. You're given, um, you're given a kind of zoom out, some of the gaps get filled in, and then you kind of move forward. And it's got some time travel mechanics so that you would see this building, you would see this site over 12,000 years of history. Um, so obviously this building's only going to be there for a fraction of that time, but you see what came before and what comes after. Um, but you're having a conversation, and then that's setting your interpretation of the past. 
and your interpretation of the past will be correct, but another player will end up interpreting it differently, and their island or their building or their site will look different, and therefore their understanding of the history of the entire um, island will be different. So just to show, this is that same site and three different ways to rebuild it based on your dialogue with the past. So you are only ever given an incomplete set of evidence, and from that evidence, you create what you think is the most reasonable or interesting recreation of the past, and they're all valid. Um, so this is my kind of this game is kind of like therapy for me to try to get over the trauma of having to kind of build these sites where, like I said, 90% of it is just a gap in knowledge. So ending about on time for me, that's, that's my kind of discussion of level of detail in games and maybe how you, some ways that you might negotiate or at least become aware of how you can work with being sensitive to style so that you can build in some story into your environment and also um, finding ways to make your environment richer by not being afraid of those gaps in the data, but instead working in a sort of plausible imagination to, to fill those gaps. And maybe those are opportunities for storytelling with your players. So thank you very much.